Right. Um, welcome, everyone, to the 84th meeting of New Directions in Group Theory and Triangular Categories. Today, our speaker is Lars Winter Christensen from Texas Tech University, and he'll be talking to us about the Dirac category of a regular ring. Thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation. Um, first of all, apologies for missing out the O in category. I'm still puzzled. I thought I had copied from the abstract, but uh, that's my problem. Um, so what I've done, I have. I hope that you'll just interrupt me during the talk with any questions you may have, uh, for two reasons. I mean, it's. I mean, you, you're probably not the only one who has your, has the question, anyhow. And the other thing is that I I sort of normally meet with my TA right on the hour. I did tell them that I might be a little late today, but I would like to 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 not go too much past what would be my uh, my 11 a.m. I also have to teach. So. <clears throat> What I'm going to talk about today, well, so first of all, a little bit just of, of background. So what I'm interested in is the uh, derived category of a regular ring, understanding what it looks like. So throughout the talk, R is going to be a, a commutative Noetherian ring, and, uh, and D of R is the derived category. And I'm going to, whenever I need it, I'm going to use, uh, like, I think of complexes as going horizontally. And I'm going to use symbols like this to indicate, for example, in this case, using homological notation. So this means that this symbol here means the subcategory of complexes whose homology vanishes in high degrees. And of course, if it had been closed on the other side, it would be homology vanishing in low degrees. And if it's closed on either sides, it's bounded homology. The in the local setting, which is actually not the one I'm interested in, but let's just start there. Um, a a local commutative Noetherian local ring is is regular if the dimension the and that's the cruel dimension of the ring equals the embedding dimension that's the minimal number of generators of the maximal ideal. So that's the first bullet in in the theorem, and the theorem here is is more or less the Auslander Buchbaum Sayer characterization of of regular local rings from the from the mid 1950s that a regular uh, local ring is characterized by having finite global dimension so the global dimension is the supremum of the projective dimensions of of all modules and i mean all in the local case just the fact that all modules have finite projective dimension actually means that this supremum is 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 finite because the the cruel dimension here is actually an upper bound. So, and as usual, there's a test object, the the simple module, the residue field K, projected dimension of K already gives away that the ring is is regular. So that's the definition in the local case. And then as as usual in commutative algebra, uh, a not local ring uh, is deemed regular if it is regular at every prime ideal or equivalent you wish, wish just at, at every maximal ideal. But regularity is 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 defined locally. So I'm interested in the drive category, which means that I I have to talk not only about modules, but about complexes and modules, of course. And so just in case, or for those who might not have seen it, um, when resolving modules, um, all resolutions are fine. I mean, it's just a complex of projective modules with with the properties that you uh, that you expect. In the case of complexes, one has to one has to be a little more careful. So we one is not interested in just any complex of projective modules. Rather, one is interested in complexes that are called semi-projective. That's at least what I call them. Some people would call them DG projective. Um, you may have seen K projective. Uh, so a semi-projective complex is a k-projective complex of projective modules. So, so you can take either either of these bullets as the definition of what it means to be a, a semi-projective complex. Um, the functor Hom P blank is exact, just as is the case for the definition of modules. And then it has to preserve homology isomorphisms or quasi-isomorphisms, as, as I call them. And, and another way of saying it is that it's a complex of projective modules and that the functor preserves acyclicity. Two important, trivial, but in this in this talk, actually important examples of, of semi-projective complexes are just any old complex of projective modules as long as it's zero in low enough degrees. 
So a complex of projective modules that that sort of uh, disappear that's that's uh, that's zero and low degrees. So something that looks like the projective resolution of a module. In in this setting, we would usually think of a module as being a complex that sits in degree zero, and then when you start resolving because we're using homological notation, you're building out towards the left, but and nothing happens on the right-hand side, you just have all zeros. So that kind of complexes that, that one is used to as thinking of a projective resolution, those are still semi-projective complexes. And then the other one might seem, seem trivial, it's contractible complexes. So just a complex that the definition, formally speaking, of course, is that, that the identity is homotopic to the zero map, uh, and all it means is that the complex, if you if you break it into short exact sequences, all of those short exact sequences of kernels and images, which are also kernels because it's it's acyclic, uh, all of those short exact sequences are split. And then one defines the projective dimension in in the case of complexes as as you would think, that the projective dimension is at most p if there is a homology isomorphism from a semi-projective complex p to the complex m that's uh, with pn equal to zero for n greater than p. So a semi-projective complex that actually stops uh, somewhere in high degrees and and is isomorphic in the drive category to the to the complex that that you're interested in. An important statement in in the study of just modules over regular rings is a is a theorem by uh, by Bass and Murty, uh, some point in the sixties, uh, which says that so in general, if if you're looking at not finitely generated modules, uh, you can build yourself a module that uh, that locally at every prime has finite projective dimension, and yet it has uh, globally speaking, it has infinite projective dimension. Uh, that actually can't happen for um, for a finitely generated module, and um, and there's a similar statement for complexes, which is the one that's listed as as the theorem here. So if your complex has homology that's bounded, so zero in both very large and large and low degrees, and the homology modules are degree wise finitely generated, uh, then one can detect finiteness of the projective dimension globally over R uh, locally at at primes. And so I should, the example here below illustrates that uh, one does need to make an assumption on the boundedness of the complex because you could, a cheap way to make yourself a complex is to just take a graded module. So I'm just thinking of all the, the differentials being the zero map. And then you, you can place, um, z mod nz in in degree n and then at um, at uh, when when uh, n is a prime and what then happens is that you will get projective dimension uh, actually p plus one at every prime and since the primes go on forever that means that the projective dimension of the of the whole complex is actually infinite So the a classic way of the first theorem here is is a classic way of of characterizing regular rings. So the ring is no longer longer local. In the local case, we have the Auslander Buchsbaum Sayer theorem that says that being regular means finite global dimension. Um, you don't quite have that in the Nagata has a famous example of a regular ring of of infinite global dimension. Um, so, so what what one knows about the relation between regularity and and homological dimensions is is what's stated in the first theorem here that finiteness of the cyclic modules R mod a prime ideal is enough, or for that matter, finiteness of the projective dimension for for every uh, complex with bounded and degree wise finitely generated homology, and and of course in the proof of this, this is where the 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 bass murty theory comes in because the key is that finiteness of the projective dimension of an object like this globally can actually be detected locally. So that's the connection between finite projective dimension of these objects and then the ring 
being a regular local ring at, at every prime. So that's that's background on on regular rings. And then the statement I want to talk about today is the second theorem on on this on this page, this one here. Um it is it is not new, at least not if you um if you ignore the second bullet for a while. Uh, so the, the equivalence of the first, uh, third, and fourth statements um, can be found already in a paper from 2010 by Srikanda Yenga and Alina Jakob. Um, so it's, it's a description of a, a characterization of regular rings in terms of just uh, of complexes and and how which uh, in the drive category so well you can see what they say but it says that every complex of projective modules is semi-projective that's not the norm as i said uh in, in just a complex of projective modules uh being semi-projective usually it works if if it's if it's bounded below if it's zero and low degrees but saying that every complex of projective modules is semi-projective is a is a statement um and another positive, the other uh, condition is that every acyclic complex of projective modules is actually contractible. And of course, I mean, in general, uh, you can have an exact sequence that's not split. So, so those are strong statements about what complexes of projective modules look like. Now that that these that these properties characterize regular rings, as I said, was was proved uh, in in two thousand ten in a two thousand ten paper. Um, and there are similar statements uh, for complexes of injective modules and complexes of, of flat modules. Uh, we'll, we'll get to those, but it was it was proved by using um, work from from earlier in the in the arts by Peter Jorgensen, uh, Henrik Krause, and and Anna Niemann, who uh, each took care of. I mean, Peter Jorgensen uh, took care of of compact generation of the homotopic category of complexes of projective modules, cause of those of injective modules, and even those of flat modules, sort of roughly speaking. Um, and it was based on on these these statements about compact generation of homotopic categories that uh, Alina and Trikan were able to prove the uh, the theorem here. And um, now I find myself in, in sort of in the in the final throes of writing a book about derived categories in commutative algebra, um, so or the use in commutative algebra. So I was and I wanted to include this thing, but we also didn't didn't want to start talk about uh, compact generation, etc. So we had to come up with something else. So so what I'll be talking about today is a proof of the theorem uh, from 2010 that works. Uh, on, that's based on on uh, on the homological homological algebra and local rings, and and it adds the second condition in the in the theorem that you see here, that the statement about all projective uh, complex of projective modules being semi-projective, it's actually sufficient to to know that for finitely generated projective modules. And as you'll see, <clears throat> um, parts of the proof is has nothing to do with commutative algebra it's it's pure homological algebra uh but um but then there's there's exactly one implication that uh where the commutative algebra comes in and and of course that has has to do with the second uh with the second bullet so let's let's give the the bullet some numbers instead so that we can we can refer to them so some of the implications are are easy to get out of the way um, if every acyclic complex of projective modules is contractible, then take any complex of projective modules P and take a semi-projective resolution. So the L here is a semi-projective complex. Then you get a mapping cone triangle like, like this one. And the mapping cone of an... Um, a quasi-isomorphism is acyclic. And the mapping cone is built out of the two complexes. So the cone of pi in this case is an acyclic complex of projective modules. That means that it's contractible. And and remember, as I said, a contractible complex of projective modules, that's that's a simple example of a 
semi-projective complex. So that means that in this triangle here, this thing here is now semi-projective and the L was semi-projective. And then there's a two out of, of three property for semi-projectivity that allows us to conclude that the um, that the complex P that we started with was uh, was semi-projective. And of course, that three implies two is, is a triviality. So this is has nothing to do with commutative algebra. It's standard, it's standard uh, homological algebra. So to prove that condition two implies that R is regular, um, it's sufficient to show that at every prime ideal, the global dimension of R localized at that prime is finite. And so this is by the ausender buchsbaum Say theorem. So that means what I really need to prove is that the projective dimension of of Kp. Uh, so this is is notation for the residue field of the local ring are localized at p. So proving that the projective dimension of Kp is is finite is is enough. So what one does is that one takes a a semi uh, projective resolution over R of R mod p. And because Armut P is a cyclic module, one can choose this resolution. Uh, of course, I mean it's it's just it's just a projective resolution of of a cyclic module, so it can be chosen degree wise, uh, finitely generated. And now, if one localizes, then of course over over R P, one now looks at a projective resolution of the residue field K P. Now. The assumption on the ring tells us that the dual complex HOM LR is semi-projective. And, and this is the unusual thing, because if you think of what L looks like, I mean, L is a projective resolution of a cyclic module. It lives in non-negative degrees. And now we're taking, the, we're dualizing it with respect to R, which means that all the arrows turn around. So now this is a complex that actually sits in not pos non-positive degrees. Nevertheless, by assumption, this thing is semi-projective. So this is this is really where the where the assumption two comes in. It's a it's a degree-wise finitely generated complex of projective modules. It looks absolutely not semi-projective. It so to speak goes the wrong way. But nevertheless, by two, it is a semi-projective complex. And now one can one can localize this complex and the localization uh, moves in. And the reason, yeah, um, I mean, after all this is, if you think of it, the dual of a free module is again a free module. So it's not a deep statement, but, um, and localizing a semi-projective complex does yield a semi-projective complex over, over the local ring. So this means that if one looks now at at this thing, so what is this? Well, this is the double dual in the local ring RP. This is the double dual of the residue field with respect to the ring. Now, how does one how does one compute uh, these derived terms? Well, one way of doing it is to to resolve the first argument here uh, projectively, and of course that's what I've done because the LP is a projective resolution of, of KP. Now, one also has to, how does one compute the outside derived HOM? Well, again, now one needs a semi-projective resolution or replacement, whatever you want to call it, of, of this object here. But this object here is already semi-projective. So this means that this derived HOM here can actually be computed just as the the double dual over RP of, of this LP. And now everything here happens, well, it's not even important that the ring is local. The important thing is that all the modules here are finitely generated free modules. So they are reflexive. They are their own double duals. I mean, just like for finite dimensional vector spaces that the, the double dual space is isomorphic to the original one. So this whole thing here is is isomorphic uh, not not only in the drive category, but on the nose, isomorphic to, to L localized at P. And um, and L localized at P was a resolution of the residue field. So this tells us that the residue field 
is its is its own double dual. And now there's a result of a realm of uh, Ayinga and Libman from around 2010 that tells us that this this the self duality of the of the residue field is enough to conclude that the ring is Gornstein. And that's sort of, I mean, philosophically, the proof is very different, but philosophically, that's the same deal as you can decide uh, that a local ring is regular, that is finite global dimension by just checking the projective dimension of, of the simple module. Well, the same deal here, over a Gornstein ring, every finitely generated um, module is its own, um, I mean, in the drive category is, is its own uh, double dual in the drive category. And, but it's enough to check that it's the case for the residue field. So this gives a way that the ring is Gornstein. So, so now at least we know that, but we're not quite there because in the hierarchy of, of local rings, uh, Gornstein, there are more Gornstein rings than there are, than there are regular rings. But now <clears throat> what does it tell us that the ring is Gornstein? Well, it tells us in particular that the, I mean, there are many ways of saying Gornstein. Um, one of them is that the ring itself has has finite injective dimension, and um, so and one way of saying that is that if we want to look at x uh, k p r p, then there's zero everywhere but in in one spot, and that's one spot is is actually the dimension. So what that means is that if one looks at at this object here in the drive category, then in particular the homology is bounded below. It's actually concentrated in one degree. But the important thing is that it's, it is bounded below. Because uh, whenever one takes um, the, uh, the drive tensor product of complexes that are bounded below, the same is true for the tensor product. And that's again because when these things are, how does one compute the derived tensor product? Again, resolving uh, resolving at least one of the arguments projectively, and as long as the homology of the uh, of the the object the complex sits like this, you can do a resolution that also only goes out to the left that's bounded below. And um, so, uh, so this tells us that that this tensor product here is um, this derived tensor product here is bounded below. But now again, so. If we if we look at it to to compute this derived tensor product, I need a uh, to resolve this guy, but I already have a semi-free resolution. That was the the complex homo p l p r p from from before, so I can just tensor this with the residue field over k. Now, because the I mean this is just after all this is just a complex of free r p modules. So, uh, so tensoring that with K is the exact same thing. Well, it's isomorphic uh, to uh, to harming LP into KP. In both cases, you could just get in every degree you get a vector space at KP vector space of dimension whatever the rank was of of the free module in that degree. But now let's remember uh, what is LP. Well, LP is a resolution. Of KP, so this means that what I'm actually looking at here is the derived harm KP KP. So what this tells me, this whole thing here is is bounded, uh, has homology uh, bounded below. So that tells us that the X is cohomology. So that tells us that the X KP KP are zero for for large M because that corresponds to 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 uh, to low. Uh, to very negative uh, homological degrees. So this means that, so what does this mean? This means that KP has finite projective dimension. And then as I said at the, at the top of the proof, then by also the books bound there, we can conclude, conclude that, that RP is regular. So, so that's sort of the, that's the commutative algebra part of, of the argument. And as you can see, it's like a, it's a two tier, um, uh, it's a, it's a it's a two stage uh, rocket where you first prove stage one is to prove that at least the ring is Gornstein and then in the second step you prove that you actually have your hands on a regular ring and all of that as I said is done locally which is fine because we can we can decide regularity of of the ring globally by checking it at every prime but that's the definition.
Now, then one has to get from, uh, from regularity to uh, acyclicity of, of every projective complex of R modules. And um, so how does one do that? Well, first of all, I'm, I'm going to cheat. Well, I'm not going to cheat, but I'm going to, f to first consider the case where the global dimension of R is, is finite. And of course, as I said, there are regular rings that that are not um, that don't have finite global dimension. But uh, but bear with me. Uh, you'll see in the next slide that uh, that we're almost there. So if we assume that the global dimension is finite, we can take a look at. So we take a, a complex, an acyclic complex of projective modules. It breaks into short exact sequences like this, where I I've not bothered to write the the images of the differentials as boundaries because the acyclicity tells me that the image is just the cycles in the next module over. So I'm just writing it like this. So I can, I can as always break the complex into so short exact sequences like this. And as you'll see, every, every cycle is sort of a first syzygy of the cycle before. So as long as the global dimension is finite, say n, well, then, well, and I'm using something else. But as long as it's finite, I can consider any cycle uh, submodule here to be a large enough syzygy of something that lives further out, and that forces that cycle module here to be to be uh, to be projective, because every cycle module is a high syzygy of a cycle module further to its right. So the fact that there's a uniform bound. On, on the projective dimension of modules over R forces all of these cycle modules here to be projective. And of course, when you have a short exact sequence that terminates in a projective module, well, then the whole thing splits. So, and as I said, I mean, that's, that's a way of saying that the complex itself is contractible. All the short exact sequences just split. Now, but this was all under this extra assumption that the global dimension is finite, which of course is not a reasonable assumption. Uh, well, I mean, it doesn't do it. But um, there is what comes to the rescue is is the result that, um, to my knowledge, was first proved in in two thousand in a uh, I think Pacific Journal of Math paper by by Dave Benson um, and Goodell. And it says that if you have a thing like like this, uh, so a short exact sequence uh, in which the module, you have the same uh, module at a flat module at, at either end and then a projective module in the middle. In, in that case, the module F actually has to be projective uh, of itself. So if you, it, it looks strange, right? But that's what it says. Um, so, and it, as I said again, it's important that that it's the same flat module. There's a later paper uh, from I don't know seven years, six seven years ago by by uh, Sergio Estrada, uh, Silvia Bazzoni, and the yeah, third person whose name I'm blanking on right now. Sorry about that. Uh, where they study, they call these modules cyclic modules that fit in in short exact sequences like this, and they do sort of a broader study of them, uh, but. Uh, and and get similar conclusions with uh, in in other cases, but but the original one is the one we need. So it's flat, same flat module on either side, and then a projective module in the middle. So now let's now let's accept that the global dimension could be finite. Well, still at every prime ideal, I'm dealing with a local um, I'm dealing with a local ring because remember I'm proving that one implies four. So the assumption is that the ring R is is uh, is regular. So locally at every prime, I'm dealing with a regular local ring, so the global dimension is finite. And when I localize my, my acyclic complex of projective R modules at the prime P, well, then I get an acyc acyclic complex of projective RP modules. And because the finiteness of the global dimension, well, that complex of RP modules is contractible. So what this tells me is that locally at at every uh, at every prime, the cycle module in in P are projective. 
Now, a module can be locally projective at every prime and not globally projective. That's just how it is. But uh, projective modules are flat. So I can at least get to, and flatness can be detected locally. So I can, I can at least get to conclude that the cycle modules in the complex P are flat modules. And now if you look at it, uh, now let's take all the short exact sequences in the complex and just and just string them together like this. Um, of course, so for each for each n, I'm just looking here at the the split exact sequence uh, from before. And the point is that this this coproduct here and this coproduct here, of course, are the same module because they are just the coproduct of all the cycle modules. So here I have a flat module, here I have the exact same flat module, and here in the middle I have the coproduct of all the projective modules of the um, of the complex, which is again a projective module. So now I can apply the Benson and Goodell results to this particular short exact sequence and then conclude that that this thing here is is projective. And so now the cycle modules in the complex P are projective and then the complex splits. And that was that was the statement in in four. So so there's the theorem again. There's the theorem again. So um so the 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 two to one uh, is a commutative algebra argument and from going from from one and down to to, to four uses this uh, this work of uh, of Benson and Goodell. I should say that some of you might be familiar with um, uh, a 2009 paper by by Amna Neiman where he also proves this statement. It seems that he wasn't aware of the other one, but it's implicit also in in his in his um, uh, paper there that when you take an if you take an, a pure acyclic complex of uh, of projective modules, then actually all the the cycle modules which are are flat end up being projective, and the thing and the thing uh, splits. And for those who are interested in such things, I mean, the an an offshot of this is that if you have a so-called semi-flat complex, if you know what it is, a uh, semi-flat complex that is consists of projective modules, then it's actually then it's actually semi-projective. Now, as I said, um, in the original 2010 paper by by uh, Alina Yakov and, and Shrikanda Enga, uh, there were similar statements uh, about characterizing regular rings in terms of complexes of injective modules and complexes of, of flat modules. And, um, and I've put those together uh, just here in, in one omnibus uh, theorem. So the first condition is the same that R is regular. And then as was the case with complexes of projective modules, two and three says that one could one could replace projective by injective. So the statement is that every complex of injective R modules is semi-injective, semi-injective being defined dually to, to um, semi-projective or that every acyclic complex of injective modules is contractible. So these two here, two and three here, are just the, the injective version of, of the last two bullets in the theorem we just went through. Uh, what is a semi-flat complex? Well, let's just say that it's one whose character complex is semi-injective. So there's a notion of semi-flatness, and it plays together with semi-injectivity the way flatness and injectivity um, play together. So we can take that as the definition. And then the the complex, every complex of, of flat modules is semi-flat is the equivalent of of the, the third condition up here. And then for complexes of flat modules, you don't quite get um you don't quite get contractibility. And of course that should not be that should not be a uh, a surprise because a, just a short exact sequence that terminates in a flat module doesn't split, uh, but it is a pure sequence. And uh, so what you get is is a complex of that every complex of flat modules is pure acyclic, which just means that all the all the cycle modules are flat modules. And uh, as you'll see, the 
I mean, at least the proof I'm going to give now actually ends up, uh, some things are easier, but it actually, we actually end up again uh, using the second condition in, in the first theorem. So the one that, that where local algebra plays a, a role in the proof. So the first the first argument goes a little like like what we looked at before. You start with an acyclic complex of R modules and take a prime ideal. Uh, you localize and you get an acyclic complex of injective modules over the local ring. Local ring has finite global dimension. So by an argument similar, dual to, to the one we used before, every every cycle module in that acyclic complex is a high cosystogy of, well, as high as you want. So this means that since we can look at a piece of the complex I as just being an injective resolution of a cycle in some degree, well, then just move further out until you reach the global dimension, then when you break off the injective resolution there, which means computing the the cycle module here for high enough V, uh, well, then you're there. That thing has to be an injective thing. And now injectivity is something that can be detected locally. So this means we don't need to jump through uh, hoops like the one with the benson Goodall result. We can just conclude that the cycle modules in the complex of injectives are themselves injectives. And therefore, all of these exact sequences that the complex breaks into, they all split. So every acyclic complex of injective modules ends up being contractible. All of these ones split. And going from, from three to two, to all complexes of injective modules being, being uh, semi-injective, also completely mimics the, the argument we used before. It's standard homological algebra. Take a semi-injective resolution like this, like this. Look at the mapping cone triangle. The mapping cone here is built out of these two complexes of injective modules, and it is acyclic, so it um, so it's it is um, it's contractible. That means, in particular, it's semi-injective. So now you have a semi-injective complex here, the semi-injective complex here. Two out of three forces E to be semi-injective. And from there to four is um, you take a complex of flat modules. Well, the character complex is a complex of injective modules. And condition two says that every complex of injective modules is semi-injective. So that means that uh, the character complex of your complex F is semi-injective. And as I said before, we can take that to be the definition of uh, what it means to be to be semi-flat. So the conclusion is that that F is is semi-flat. And any semi any acyclic semi-flat complex is pure acyclic. That's just a fact and it's not hard to prove. But I mean that doesn't really take an argument. That's a standard fact. So now to get from five to one, so again, so condition five every acyclic complex of flat modules is pure acyclic, and we need to, to get back to R being regular. And so the way we're gonna do it is that we are going, we're going to prove that, uh, again, that R is, is regular at, at every prime. And it's now enough to look at, by the, by the first theorem, we can we can we can check that by looking at complexes of finite generated projective RP modules. So, um, we take a semi-free resolution over RP of such a complex, and then the cone of this is an acyclic complex of free RP modules. And so, if I look at it as a complex over R. It is a complex of flat R modules. But the assumption on R is that um, that acyclic complexes of flat R modules are pure acyclic. So this means that the cone is, is now pure acyclic. So in particular, when I look at cycles in the cone complex, they are flat as R modules, 
and therefore they are flat. They are already RP modules, and an RP module is well has the same flat dimension even over over R and over RP. But I am now looking at a um, looking at a local ring, and flat modules do have finite projective dimension. They always well when the ring has finite uh, cruel dimension at least. So and the local ring does. So this means that all of these these flat modules again the same trick uh, because every flat module has finite projective dimension and because the complex I'm looking at is a complex of projective RP modules I can look at every cycle in in the complex as being a high enough syzygy of some other cycle and therefore it ends up being projective. So this means that each of, of the cycle modules is actually projective. And now that makes it, uh, that makes the complex contractible and therefore it's semi-projective. So now go back and look at the, at the, uh, at the old, uh, or look at the, at the uh, mapping cone triangle again. We were resolving P with a um, semi-projectively so this means that, and now this one is a contractible complex. So now I get to conclude that P was semi-projective uh, by the two out of, of free property. And that's all I need to prove because that was the statement in the first theorem that we proved that a complex of finitely generated projective R modules is semi-projective. And we just proved that every, every complex of uh, finitely generated projective RP modules is semi-projective. So that makes the local ring RP regular by the first theorem. So, so in the commutative setting or the commutative Noetherian setting, uh, the, uh, the, the arguments, uh, the extra condition that, that talks about complexes of finitely generated modules uh, actually also provides for a proof of uh, the characterization of regular rings in terms of complexes of injective modules and complexes of, of flat modules. So, so that 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 extra condition that was added to the first theorem when compared to the the two thousand and nine results, two thousand ten results, that extra condition sort of uh, packs uh, enough information to substitute for for compact generation of of the homotopy categories, both in the case of projective modules, injective modules, and flat modules. So <clears throat> finally, let me talk about a couple of, of corollaries to, um, to, um, to these theorems. So, um, well, I mean, here's the first one. <laughs> so, a uh, you, as you may recall, one can one can one can characterize uh, Noetherian rings uh, by the fact that uh, that coproducts of injective modules are um, are again injective. I mean, normally a product of injectives is injective, but uh, being Noetherian is the same as as coproducts. Or, for that matter. Um, uh, filtered uh, filtered co-limits of of injective modules are injective, and there is a. I mean, I'm not saying that that there is a that there is that 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 should explain why this is true, but you see that it's it's sort of the same kind of of conditions that that enter in the first corollary here because it is it characterizes regular rings as those rings where every countable Co-product of semi-injective complexes again is is semi-injective, or even that a uh, that a co-limit of semi-injective complexes is is semi-injective. And of course, again, I mean it's it's not hard to see why these things shouldn't be true in in, in general because uh, you can you can you can take uh, complexes of bounded above complexes say of injective modules so just as just as every bounded below complex of projective modules 
is semi-projective, while every bounded above complex of injective modules is semi-injective. So you can build yourself a family of bounded above semi-injective complexes. You can you can take the co-product. Uh, we are in the Ethereum setting, so you will again be dealing with a complex of injective modules. But of course, in general, we don't expect, or in general, just any complex of injective modules is not semi-injective. But in the case of a uh, in the case of a regular ring, they actually are. And um, and by the the usual uh, short exact sequence uh, associated to to filtered co-limits, uh, one can get from from the co-product statement to the statement about filtered filtered co-limits. And again, in I don't know if analogy is is the right is the right word, but um, I mean it has to do with properties of the functors that are involved, right? But Coherent rings are characterized by um, by products of flat modules being being flat, and um, and regular rings are characterized as as you can see here uh, by um, by saying that any coproduct of uh, of semi flat complexes is semi flat, or again it's sufficient to um, to just do a countable uh, uh, co-product. So if every countable co-product of complexes of of semi-flat complexes is semi-flat, that implies that that the ring is is regular. And that this is not true in general, of course, is is you can you can easily convince yourself of that, just as in the case of complexes of injective modules, because as is the case for semi-projectivity. Um, you can take complexes, bounded below complexes of flat modules. They'll be semi-flat. And now just take ones that move further and further out to the right. Take the product of the whole thing. Sure enough, in the in the Ethereum in particular coherent setting, degree-wise, the product of those things will be will be flat. So you'll be looking at a complex of flat modules, but um but you won't be, that of course doesn't in general mean that the complex is semi-flat. That's equivalent to R being, to R being regular. So it seems that I think, I, well, I know that I planned my talk for, for 50, 55 minutes um, in the hope that I could, that I could honor my, my normal meeting time at 11. So, um, so I'll stop here and, uh, and ask for, and ask for questions. Thank you, Lars. Um... Can we all unmute ourselves and give the speaker a round of applause? Okay, if you have any questions for us, you can ask them now. Are these clapping hands or are these question asking hands? I guess they are clapping hands. Right. What happens when I move to commutative ring spectra? Can I get similar statements? Ethereum hmm. commutative Ethereum ring spectra. That's actually a good question. Um, so I haven't thought of it because, as I as I said in 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 the uh, in my opening remarks, um, I started thinking about this because I liked uh, I liked the results. Um, and it's not that I dislike the proofs, but I needed I needed a different kind of proofs because they needed to find they needed to fit in a, in a monograph that's that's already big enough. Uh, so uh, so my 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 focus was on on finding a a uh, a sort of more classic homological commutative algebra uh, proof. I did not think about pushing it in the in the other direction. Uh, I don't know. I mean, a person who might have. Uh, would have been Shrikant. There's there's no mention of it in the um, in the uh, in the paper, and it's it's not something that I think a lot about. So uh, I uh, I won't even I I don't even want to speculate. Any more questions or comments? Uh, 
Is there a sort of global statement that you can make? Uh, what do you mean by global? Uh, uh, something for an Ethereum scheme, some similar type Ah, of property. Maybe some of Stevenson's um, local global principles. Try to use. um, yeah, I mean this the 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 statements here are already for for not local rings, right? So, um. Um, I'm just trying to think. I mean, the problem is, I mean, my concern would be that when you look at sheaves, I mean, there's really, I mean, the problem is with an, a good analogy of, of finitely generated projective things, right? That's the problem. Uh, that's always the problem when you, when you, when you try to, to do these things in, in the geometric setting. So, so since the, since the, 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 um, The core of the argument here very much uh, evolves around finite to generated projective modules. I, my guess would almost be that uh, you might actually want to go the the categorical way instead. Uh, I'm not sure that that this way of proving them would be would be the right way uh, if if you want a uh, if you want a statement for schemes uh, simply because of of the reliance of 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 the finitely generated uh, projective objects. That would be my, But that if would you be have my own. Cool, thanks. Yeah. Uh, last but if you have, I mean, in um, I mean, um, in response to like not person response to, I want to add something to past question. If you have enough vector bundles, I mean, can't you still? Yeah, I mean, if you if you work in a setting where you were uh. Then, then you might be able to push the same thing through. Uh, If you have an Apple line bundle, perhaps you might be able to argue something pretty similar. Yeah, possibly. Yeah, I mean, yeah, depending on which, I mean, how much, you, depending on how much you're willing to to uh, to, uh, to to assume. But yeah, because you you will need uh, you will need for this approach, you will um, you will need something like that. Yes. Correct. Any more questions? Uh, there is a question by David in the chat. What is mm -hmm. the paper called? Uh, the one by by Ayenga and um, and uh, Alina Jakob. I assume. No, maybe. Oh yeah, okay, maybe that one. Yeah. Yes. Uh, let me just let me just find it. Uh, hang on. One I thought second. I thought David. I thought you were asking. Uh, about the book that Lars mentioned. Uh, let me just find the paper first. Uh, the, the book is, I mean, the book is, is, uh, uh, is on my web page. Um, if anyone, I mean, the current version there probably has like 800 pages. So I will put up a longer one uh, before long. Our, our contract with the, with the publisher says that We can have everything but the last draft. I, we can have everything up through the last draft, whatever that means. But that's what it says uh, on the uh, on our web page. So this means that at some point, when when they get the version that's going to be printed, we'll have to take it down. So uh, how about sorry. the last draft minus one page? Yeah, I mean exactly. I mean, with of course, with I mean, there's also what one can also wonder if the Wayback Machine might might stop by and and make a copy, right? Uh, that has been done. Uh, so, uh, well, let me find this reference first. It's called Homological Dimensions and Regular Rings, uh, Journal of Algebra, uh, Volume Three Twenty Two, and it's from two thousand nine, actually. In 2009, I don't know why I was mistaken about that. So, it's also the only uh, joint paper by by Ayenga and Jakob. So, so uh, it's it's easy to nail it down on on MathSignet uh, should you want to. So, any other questions, brothers?
Right. Well, if there are no more questions, um, let us thank the speaker once again. Thank you very much. Thanks for letting me finish on time. I don't I don't like to be late for the first meeting of the semester. <laughs> That's such a bad president. <laughs> okay. Have okay. a good thank you very much. Uh, thank you everyone. Have a good day or evening. Bye. Okay, bye. Thanks.